This talk today is going to focus on the feeding ecology um, and the study of that through isotope analysis in lemurs. So he does all of his work on wild lemurs in Madagascar, um, but we can learn a lot from that and how we can apply it to our lemurs here. So please welcome James. And Please help yourself more questions. So, uh, and and this talk is, uh, I mean, feel free to interrupt me at any time if you want. Um, you know, I've I've got it gauged. Um, so I'll explain what isotope ecology is. But you know, I'm you know, if you if there's any point you want to raise your hand or have a comment, feel free to. Um, how many folks know of isotope ecology, or heard of it, or? On it, so I, I, I'll I'll explain it too. So that's going to be um, a portion of the talk. I'll actually explain um, stable isotope ecology and why it's actually very interesting, and all the very neat applications that isotope ecology or stable isotope analysis, um, how useful it is. And I will say this right off the bat: it's a really good complement to existing data sets. So it's very good in terms of understanding if you want to watch animals, and then you have these isotope values that you want to analyze as well. So you can pair it with molecular uh, techniques, you can pair it with behavioral um, observations. So it's good in, 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 um, in terms of that. Uh, one of the drawbacks is that some of the things that you can say are very, very broad. But if you take, you know, if you triangulate using other methods, then you can kind of get a good, um, you can get a good um, bearing on the, the ecology and the habitat use of some of these animals. So uh, the, the, the title of the talk, Using Stable Isotope Analysis to Understand Lemur Ecology uh, Through Time and Space. And OK, I just put that there. It's my university <laughs> affiliation. It just really threw off the whole fin shui of the slide if I had it there. So what well, did chime it in? So OK, I became a primatologist because I disliked chemistry. Uh, yeah, I did not want to do chemistry. In fact, chemistry is what got me out of zoology. So we'll talk about chemistry very, very broadly, but you probably have all heard of an isotope. Am I correct? Yeah, probably have forgotten what it was, but an isotope uh, is, um, we have, we have uh, elements and those elements, there's atoms, and if you add neutrons onto those atoms, you've got isotopes. So uh, here we've got uh, light isotopes and heavier isotopes, and they're called stable, because they don't break down into something else. So the ones that we'll be talking about are carbon-13 and carbon-12. Carbon-13 is not going to break down, down into carbon-12. Uh, so here's a, a, a picture of hydrogen. Um, and here you've got one neutron and one proton. And here you've got two neutrons and one proton. Now the behavior of the, of, of the atom doesn't change too much because it still has one electron that's negatively charged. But it's a little heavier. And so if you were thinking about pushing to, well, let's just think about cars. You can push a, a Tesla, right? They're our nice eco-friendly car. You're pushing a Tesla up a hill, um, and then you're taking a Tesla and you're throwing an extra spare tire on it. And now you're pushing that up the hill. The one with the extra spare tire is going to weigh just a little bit more. It's not really going to change its behavior, but it's going to weigh a little more. So why is this important? Well, plants incorporate carbon into their tissues, and they incorporate that carbon primarily what we're interested in in terms of producing their own food through photosynthesis. Um, so they're, getting, you know, they're, they're incorporating this carbon dioxide. Some of that carbon dioxide is carbon-13, and some of it is carbon-12. Plants generally like to have the lighter isotope. Uh, I'm anthropomorphizing here, of course. Um, and they dissuade against the heavier isotope. Okay, so what are these types of plants? You may have heard of C3 plants, C4 plants, and CAM plants. So your C3 plants uh, are your trees and shrubs, and your C4 plants are your grasses, and your CAM plants, and the reason we're talking about CAM plants today, oftentimes you see isotope talks and people don't discuss CAM plants um, because oftentimes they're not in the relevant ecosystems. But in Southwest Madagascar, you find a lot of CAM plants and not very many C4 plants. And I'll show you in just a second, these guys have the same carbon signatures. Uh, these guys have a much different uh, carbon signature because they 
really are choosy in when, what they're, the types of carbon that they're incorporating. They incorporate less of the heavier isotope into their tissues than these two plants. Now, why is this really cool for us who are interested in, in animal ecology? Because the carbon values that these plants have are passed on to the animals that eat them. So here we got a classic giraffe, and a giraffes are what we refer to oftentimes as browsers, because they eat browse, you know, they eat seeds and fruits and leaves. And here is a wildebeest, what was referred to as a grazer. And here is a varocia fox. And these Varocia fox that, that I study found um, throughout southwest Madagascar, they like eating these cam plants. Now, one neat application of doing stable isotopes uh, is we live in North Carolina and we're dominated by a C3 uh, isoscape or vegetation. And all these trees out here are for the most part C3. If you were to sample my hair, you would find that I have a C4 signature. And that's because I eat a C4 grass consistently all the time. Because I love Coca-Cola. It's a little vice of mine. And Coca-Cola is, uh, it gets its sugar from high fructose corn syrup. And corn is a C4 grass that was cultivated by the Mesoamericans thousands of years ago. So here we've got apples. These are great, you know, your classic C3 uh, you know, we have hundreds or thousands of C3 cultigens. Um, corn, sorghum, you may have heard of sorghum as well. Those are C4 plants. Um, and then here, the only one, one of the only uh, plants that we actually eat that's, C, that, that's a cam plant is pineapples. Um, and so these guys are going to have uh, much different uh, carbon values uh, than these plants and the animals that eat them will as well. Mm -hmm. I'm not understanding exactly what plants. Cams are succulents. They're just succulent plants. And they use a, a different photosynthetic pathway um, as opposed to C3 plants and C4 plants. And I just use a... What's the CAM? Caresulin acid metabolism. Yeah. 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 So it's a completely... Without getting into the biomechanics and the chemistry, yeah. Yeah. Come on, we all heard of that, right? Do you, you say that at parties? Um, so here's one of these cam-dominated uh, forests of southwest Madagascar. If you've never been to southwest Madagascar, it's quite alien. You, you, you all are very aware that there's a high degree of endemism in south, I'm, I'm sorry, in uh, Madagascar. Um, you even see it here with these, these plants. Um, and here's a shifak inhabiting that ecosystem. Again, if you were to plot this um, on, on a figure, uh, what you're looking at here are less negative values, and less negative values are higher than more negative values, right? I remember when I would st first started doing this, was, okay, so negative 10 is a bigger number than negative 30. Um, and what you're doing is you're looking at the isotopic values of some of these plants. So here's those C3 plants, those trees and those shrubs, and here's those C4 plants, those grasses. The take home message for us is it's bimodal. You can really see distinctively when an animal is eating C3 versus if it's eating C4. They're gonna have, uh, have non-overlapping values unless they're a mixed feeder, something like a rhinoceros that's gonna eat browse and it's going to eat graze, then it's gonna have a mixed signature. So, you could, so people who have out there you know, studied all these African ungulates, they thought that they knew these diets pretty well, and of course they did, because they spent a lot, many hours watching them. But then when they actually started doing isotope analysis of it, they found out that grazers were actually eating a lot more browse than they thought, and browsers were actually eating more graze than they thought. Okay, so the other thing that's really neat about isotopes is they're incorporated into our tissues and, in, and, the, and they're passed out of our gut. So you can uh, do fecal analysis, which I'll, I'll show you some fecal data here um, in a minute. Um, but you can also look at our tissues. So here are some uh, grazing uh, I put in wild horses. I guess those are wild horses that kind of look like donkeys. Um, and uh, you can serially sample them for you throughout time and see how, you know, you know, you can, you can cut off, you know, you can get a bunch of hair, line it up, and then analyze that section of it, and you can see when they switch their diets or not. Um, here are, here's an African elephant um, and African uh, tusks, so these are teeth, 
right? And they grow and they grow similar to trees. And what some folks did uh, in the mid 90s is they looked at ivory uh, and they looked at uh, the C3 plants and C4 plants um, into elephants and they were actually able to source ivory. And then they went and they found out who was actually poaching some of this and they could trace it back to these shifts in these diets. Um, and then these are really neat studies. So these are right whales. And again, these right whales have barnacles growing on them. And so you can sample, of course, uh, the tissues of the right whale. Um, here's actually some baleen. So you could sample this through time and see shifts in its diet. Now the diets are different because they're primarily eating animals, but they're in oceans. And these animals uh, in these oceans have different values. Um, and you can actually look at these barnacles. Now, you, can, you don't have to just look at what we'll talk about today is carbon and nitrogen. You can also look at things like uh, hydrogen and oxygen. Well, this is really fantastic because these guys are living in H2O and brackish waters and coastal waters have different hydrogen and oxygen values than some of these waters way out um, off these coasts and some of these deep so they've actually been able to trace migrations of right whales um, and all other things. They've, they've done this with loggerhead turtles um, and you can get tissues from them um, and you can also get tissues from the things riding on them. So lots of, again, good ways to supplement your data set. Uh, very hard to, uh, to track these animals when they're underwater um, and you, know, you can use cameras and these sorts of things but you can also just look at some of these isotope values. Okay, so again, because these are incorporated into tissues, you can look at museums, uh, specimens. I won't spend any time talking about this mummy here, but I can tell you this is an interesting study of these, the Salvo man-eating lions. Um, these are, this, this is actually a male lion. It's a lion that doesn't, they're the, the group of lions that don't grow, uh, the males don't grow these manes. And they actually analyzed the hair of some of these lions and found out they had a C for signature. Well, there was no real C4 antelopes or whatever, these grazing animals that were eating C4 foods, but there was one animal out there that was eating a lot of C4. People. People were eating maize and they were eating sorghum and these lions found out it's pretty easy to kill humans and once they did, I mean oftentimes they won't, but once they figure out how to do it, um, um, they, they were, you know, they, they became easy prey and those values then became incorporated into their tissues. Um, this is just a, a, one of the, uh, a, a very, one of the, I guess, one of the first applications of looking at um, carbon isotopes. Um, and this is a, a species called Paranthropus robustus. Has anybody ever heard of that thing? Okay, a couple of you. This is a, 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 one of our ancestors in South Africa. Uh, went extinct about 2.5 million years ago. You all, all heard of a Homo naledi, the new specimen they found in South Africa. Okay, so these guys lived uh, actually at the cave right next to where they found Homo naledi. They found that at the Rising Star Cave. Um, if you go to Swartzkrons or Sturkfontein, basically just meters away, you find this guy. Um, and they had these big, huge teeth, these sagittal, these big, huge sagittal crests. So you've got a sagittal crest on this guy here um, for massive muscle attachment. So when you look at these massive muscles, they're usually associated with eating really hard seeds and nuts. And those hard seeds and nuts are C3 foods. What happened when you looked at the, the, the calcium carbonate? So that's carbon values in the teeth found out they were eating a lot of grasses. So it makes people now start scratching their head. What is this entire masculatory system associated with? Was it, is it actually associated with eating hard foods? The isotopes tell you something different. We can get into that a little bit later, what that might actually be. Uh, but um, again, if you were to look at this uh, specimen here, uh, these big, large uh, sagittal keels and that, those big, large jaws, you would think that it's, it would eat one type of food, but if you buzz the enamel, it might actually be eating something different. Um, so isotopes can give you ideas uh, about, or give you, pro provide you a data um, for, for different, um, uh, different types of diets and diets that could change through time. So real quickly, um, 
the isotopes are also good at uh, um, uh, uncovering little mysteries. Here is a long-tailed macaque, uh, lives in a C3 environment and is eating a C4 food. It's, it's crop rating. This is important because lots of animals that crop rate end up getting killed um, or they, you know, they end up getting, well, I guess, shot and killed. Pretty much could be the same thing oftentimes. Um, here is a nocturnal little galago, hard to watch. Um, you know, folks who've worked with these mouse lemurs, right, in the wild, really, really difficult to see them. Um, if you can capture some of their, get some of their feces um, or shave them down, you can get dietary values. So how, much, how many insects are these folks eating? Um, you know, so again, if it's hard to actually watch them, one way you can get dietary data is actually analyzing some of those hair samples. And here's an orangutan who's losing its habitat. Um, and um, you can actually pick up an anthropogenic signal as well. So we've, uh, my colleagues and I have just done a big uh, paper looking at anthropogenic signals uh, among Kabali chimpanzees. And we compare them to savannah chimpanzees and chimpanzees in the Ivory Coast. Um, we actually show that you can detect an anthropogenic signal when people are disturbing these habitats. You can find it. Yep. Okay. So what is anthropogenic? Anthropogenic. Anthropogenic is basically human causing things. So in this case, uh, anthropogenic modification of their environment, and then to make it cutting down their environment. Uh, sadly enough, I mean, here's just this is a heartbreaking picture um, here. Uh, you see this used to be a rainforest that was cut down for, um, uh, for the palm oil industry. Um, and you, has anybody ever seen this picture before? Uh, absolutely heartbreaking. Anybody want to guess what that is? What's that? It unfortunately is that gal right there. Uh, and so you can pick up on these sorts of signals. Now, obviously, you don't need an isotope ecologist to go in here and do this. You can see it with your own eyes. But if you're looking at nuanced ways that our people are cutting down the forest and sometimes doing it illegally, you can get an isotope signature from that. Okay. When studying isotopes in the hair, is it to know the hair growth rate? Uh, very important. That's one of the things that isotope people have been um, really sort of interested in. We actually did it. We shaved lemur tails when we, uh, we would anesthetize them. We would get part of their hair and we'd have to measure their growth rate. So in other species, their hair grows quicker or, and slower. You know. It seems here that their growth rate is variable because mm -hmm. of the year. Yeah, yeah, and so this is. How do you factor that in? Uh, well, with the stuff that we're doing, we just uh, we just um, we will take it and we kind of backtrack how far so it grows about I think about a quarter of an inch every month, and it's an estimate, you know. But that that and, and that might actually be what Brooke Crawley's looking at because that is one of the things. We're not measuring their growth. Yeah. It just makes me wonder if we yeah. Should be well, I'd be more than I'd be more than happy to help you out on that. <laughs> and then here's this other isotope. What I'll just br briefly mention: nitrogen. And nitrogen is interesting because, uh, for our purposes today, um, it uh, will actually measure uh, your trophic level. So, if you're a carnivorous animal, you generally have higher nitrogen values. Um, so, if you are um, eating a lot of meat, if you're weaning. Right, so if you're consuming your mom's milk, you're a trophic level higher than your mom. So let's say I'm mom, I'm, my trophic level is eight, uh, my infant should be at nine, anywhere from nine to 11. What is funny about this, this, this picture here is they compared um, these uh, nitrogen values of vegans. They compared the vegans to the vegetarians uh, and the omnivores, um, and they kept finding a vegan who kept popping up here and why were they popping up here? Because they were eating bacon. <laughs> uh, and they, they, yeah, so the isotopes bore that out. Uh, same thing with the, the, the orange juice industry. Orange juices, oranges, C3. Uh, and they started finding C4 signals. They found that the, what the orange juice industry was doing, or some of these companies, is actually sweetening their orange juice with corn syrup. So it gives you true signals. So. Those vegans out there, beware, right? <laughs> Let's talk about lemurs finally. <laughs> so here are, here, here's where I did my dissertation work at the Basin Mafali Special Reserve. Uh, it's named after the Mafali people, and uh, it was established uh, 30 odd years ago. Um, and um, it, we've done, we've tagged those individuals. 
Um, there's when they're um, when they're anesthetized, they take health data from them. They measure their teeth, uh, wear on their teeth, missing teeth. Um, there's a protected little reserve there. Oh my God! There's a protected reserve, um, and then outside of that protected reserve, there's a disturbed habitat. So you can measure uh, differences between the protected um, and unprotected populations. Um, and again, they all have these little tags, so it makes for good identification. Um, here's us with, uh, with some of these lemurs on the table. I'm uh, doing some skin fold measurements. Here's actually where we would cut down their little hair. So we'd take a snippet, we'd put it in a bag, and then we'd bring it back to the States and analyze it. Um, and here is Frank Cuso, who's actually uh, taking, uh, um, he's, he's doing casts of their teeth. So he can get an idea of, of the, their dental health as well. Um, here's the site, so here's the protected area, um, and all around here is anthropogenically disturbed habitats. Um, this is one of these tagged ring-tailed lemurs. He's in the blue group, and his number is, is, is 34. I don't know if anyone knows Bert Covert. He, yeah, Bert Covert. This is Bert Covert Jr. We named him Bert Covert Jr. And what does he have to do with Duke? He got his PhD right. here. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. So Bert Covert Jr. right here. Uh, and what does he have to do with you? How do you know him? He was on my, uh, he was my PhD okay, advisor. I can't remember. I've known him for years. Professor at Colorado. He's a professor at Colorado. Yeah, that's where I got my PhD. I took a basic anthropology class with him. Yeah. He's an aw it's such a fan. Worthy of Bert Covert Jr. Being so here are here are uh, our, our, our individuals, um, and in this case, uh, individuals in the teal group are here, individuals in the orange group are here, um, individuals in the blue group. So we sampled uh, uh, lemurs. This is their hair values. Um, here's that nitrogen um, uh, axis, and here's the carbon axis. Um, and because they're tagged individuals, these are the outliers. Why isn't 142 here? And why isn't 143 here? Well, the reason is they were migrants. So we were actually able to detect migration of these, these individuals coming in and out of groups. And for the folks that are actually interested in the health, why are these guys outliers here? Well, 170 is not looking anything near uh, the orange group and 132 and 139 aren't either. They were both very, very old had lost a lot of their teeth, and were doing things like consuming feces. So they had poor health. Um, they, were, they, 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 they had very, very bad coats. Um, they were emaciated, um, and they were, had lost so much of their teeth. One of the only things that they could actually consume, and they didn't consume it primarily, but they supplemented their diet with feces, which oftentimes is uh, as high in nitrogen. So um, you have these... Uh, abhorrent uh, values. Now, the, again, isotopes are great because they bore some of this stuff out, but if you just have isotope data, it's hard to make any sense out of this. That's why it's so important to have behavioral data and isotope data as well. Um, and they also reflect the differences in where they lived. Here is a nice lush forest uh, where the teal group lived. Here's an open area where the orange group lived. And here is an area that uh, has been completely cut down by the local Mofale people, and this is primarily where the blue group lives. So we can see a couple of interesting things here. Habitat utilization, diet, and then we could explain why we have these outliers here. Um, we extended this uh, to looking at other lemur species at the Basin Mofale site. So we do have uh, ring-tailed lemurs, we do have ferocious fox, we have lepi lemurs, and we have these adorable, your head's going to explode, mouse lemurs. <laughs> and they live in different little, they live in these different little uh, social systems. I hate the term solitary. Um, they are highly, highly social, uh, but people call them solitary. Um, these guys oftentimes feed by themselves, but of course when they nest together, they're quite gregarious. Um, but they eat different diets. We, you know, this is all based on behavioral work that's been done on, on um, these species here at Beza and other places. And so we analyzed uh, their isotopic uh, values um, and they're all on the same, they're all living at the same reserve. So we plotted this, this is classic community ecology, right? Um, where, what's the trophic levels of these animals? Um, what's their, how are they partitioning their habitat differently? Um, so again, isotopes allows 
you to, to, to actually uh, use data to address some of these very, very early models put forth um, by some of these, um, these um, ecologists um, that were interested in um, the in dimension um, for some of these, for the, the, for the ways that animals are interacting with one another. So there's those three values, those three groups that we talked about before, teal, orange, uh, blue. And then here's these other species. So here's your Vero Shafak. And if we look at it on this simple, at this side here, remember we don't have any grass here, but we have cam plants. What are these guys doing? The, the lepi lemurs uh, and the Shafaks are eating more cam. Uh, what, are, what are these guys doing? Well, this is interesting. These mouse lemurs are eating a lot more cam but do mouse lemurs eat a lot of, uh, of leaves? Not really, but they eat animals that eat leaves and they're eating insects. So we found that they're eating insects that eat cam plants. Um, and they're a uh, trophic level higher uh, than the rest of these lemurs is what you'd expect. Smaller animals tend to ge generally eat um, you know, insects or foods that are high in terms of, uh, of, of nutritional yield. So there's a ring-tailed lemur. There's a Verocia Bach, a Lepi lemur, and then a mouse lemur. Okay, uh, we also did this, this, how am I on time, by the way? Do I have? It's 4.40. 4.40, what time, so we should? It started at about 4.25. 4.25, okay. So I'm doing okay time-wise? Okay. So, uh, so we, we also did this, uh, just looking at some of these, uh, the, the, just, just focusing on ring-tailed lemurs and Verocia Fox. Um, these are groups that I studied. We collected their feces um, at least once a month in the morning. We would go out, we'd collect their feces. We were collecting uh, plants that they actually ate. Um, and then we did isotopic analysis on both the plants and uh, the feces. And so these are the home ranges of these little groups. Uh, the, the green group is uh, a group of ring-tailed lemurs. Uh, so is the black group. And Vovo, or I'm sorry, Revutes, uh, is a group of Shifox. And these Shifox uh, live by uh, the Sacamena River. There's actually a river that comes down around here. And Revutes, uh, and I, if I recall, means breeze. Has anybody been to Madagascar? OK. Have you ever heard Nvovo? Has anyone ever said that? Well, that means, what's the news? Vovo. Sometimes you hear Akuri. Uh, but Vovo means the news. And there's the news, right? We had a guy in there we called Huey Lewis too because maybe you have to be around for the 80s to get that joke. So, uh, so uh, one thing that's very interesting about these, if you just look at these home ranges, you'll notice that the home ranges of these lemurs are a lot larger than that of the Shafox because the Shafox are primarily eating leaves. And if you eat leaves, your, your home ranges generally are smaller than if you're omnivorous and you're eating all of these other types of foods. So these guys are foraging, the ringtails are foraging for, for, in, whoops, for insects and for fruits and these sorts of things. Um, and the, the, the Shafox don't really have that problem. Um, it, it, there's a, so there's Burt Covert Jr. Um, and there's 565, no fancy name for this, <laughs> this gal. Uh, so these are actually, uh, this, this work has been done primarily by Michelle Sonder and Frank Cuso. The work with the Shifox, Diane Brockman, uh, you may have heard, yeah, she's, she's a Spock person, uh, UNC uh, Charlotte. Um, Charlotte? Charlotte, North Carolina? Yeah, I'm still sort of new. Um, and uh, Allison Richard, you may have heard of Allison Richard as well. This was her uh, long term project. Um, so uh, th th those folks um, are responsible for collaring them. Another fellow with the Shafak group named Richard Lawler. So what I did, uh, I was doing a parasite, a parasite ecology study uh, at the site, but I thought, well, you know what? I can kill two birds with one stone. While I'm doing my parasite work, why don't I do some feeding ecology isotope work as well? So um, we were coll I collected a bunch of behavioral data on them. Uh, we looked at four, four, these four groups. Um, uh, of uh, um, uh, one, one group of lemurs inside that protected parcel, uh, one group of shafox in that protected parcel, uh, one group of lemurs and the, uh, and the, um, uh, the disturbed habitat, and one uh, of shafox in the same. So that's where you get these four little home ranges here. Um, okay, so it was you know, very easy to do isotope work in, in the field. 
Um, obviously, if you have hair, I mean, if you were to do isotopic analysis, you take the hair, you clean it off with, you can even clean it off with ethyl alcohol. You chop it up, you put it in these little tin capsules, and you send it off to a place, a mass, a mass spectrometer, and they give you your values. Mm -hmm. What we did here is uh, we, co we, collected, um, we collected some of these, um, uh, f these plant samples, we collected the poop, um, and we dried it in a camping, uh, little camping stove. And uh, you just, it was, it's, it's a very, very arid and hot place for many months of the year. Even during the cold period uh, in this southern portion of Madagascar, throughout the afternoon it gets very, very hot and dry. Dried out the feces, dried out the uh, plants. Um, and packaged them up, labeled them, and brought them back to the states with all the right permits, of course. Um, and I think, well, I don't, and did I? <laughs> I? And I don't have the data, apparently. I forgot to put the, the data. I think I, the data for that slide is, got covered up. Um, no, I had this beautiful slide to show you. Basically, what we found uh, is when you uh, when you actually plot these the 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 the, uh, the diets on let's see something let's see if I can find something sort of similar to that if you were to plot uh, all of this the, the, that that lemur and shafak data onto something like this you found that the shafaks had a very very small uh, 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 variation in terms of their isotope values, but the ringtail lemurs had a huge one. And what that basically is reflecting again is there's more variable, var more variable isotope values among the shafox. I'm sorry, among the ringtail lemurs because they're eating a more omnivorous diet. Um, the the shafox, uh, for the most part, were eating. Um, leaves throughout the year. Now that doesn't mean that one leaf is the same as every other leaf. You know, leaves differ in terms of how much uh, of the secondary toxins they have um, and how much fiber that they have. And so animals, you know, they, they, they avoid the, 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 the leaves that are most difficult to process. Um, so there was variability. Um, and because we had these guys that were actually tagged individuals, actually see how some of the older individuals were eating different foods than some of the younger individuals. In ring-tailed lemur societies, well in both of these societies, uh, females are higher rank than males and so we could actually see low-ranking males with these weird values and they were, they were values indicative of them eating alternative types of foods. Mm -hmm. And again, not that I'm talking, it seems like poop's coming up a lot in this talk, but uh, that one of the things that the males, the low-ranking males would eat is feces. The Mofali people um, are, uh, they do not um, defecate in the ground, they defecate on top of the ground. And so they have above ground latrines. And um, so they do their business and then the Shifox, I'm sorry, the ring-tailed lemurs will come and they'll eat it. But I can go into far more depth about that <laughs> when and how, but we can, we can end it at that. It was just one story. Uh, no. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, so um, one of the, 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 the interesting things about Southwest Madagascar is it's hyper, hyper unpredictable. Uh, this place will, receives droughts uh, and it can receive cyclones like um, uh, the one that hit in 2005. Um, it's uh, Cyclone Ernest hit through here. It came. Um, you know, from the, uh, from the east, wrapped around the island between Madagascar and Mozambique, the Mozambique Channel, and pretty much it didn't run right over Bazemofali, which is about right here, but it had 130 mile winds, and when it came through this area, it tore it all apart. So there's a, the biggest city uh, in southern Madagascar is, is, is a city called Tuliar, and Tuliar got completely flooded uh, during this event, and here's here's a picture of of this um, of this cyclone. So, generally speaking, uh, it's a very drought-ridden area. It's a, there's not much rainfall, and then they can have these really long, prolonged droughts um, one year, and then the next year get hit with the cyclone. Um, if you look at the the ring-tailed lemurs, there uh, infant mortality is about 50 percent. They just it's a hard place to to cut a living there. Um, there's not much food. Um, and if a cyclone comes in uh, and knocks off the foliage uh, and knocks off all the fruit, 
um, then these animals have to use, they have to start utilizing different types of foods. Um, they have to eat new things. Um, and so there was a 2003, what we'll be looking at here in a second, was a normal year. Then you had a drought year of 2004. Then you had a cyclone of 2005. And then you had another drought year. And so we were able to look at the isotope values of these animals through all of these uh, times. Um, that's why, I mean, this is kind of a bumper sticker, right? Tump times don't last, tough people do. And so I thought, you know, tough, lem or tough times don't last, but tough lemurs do. And so these animals are extremely flexible. I mean, they can cut a living out of one of the hardest places to live. What's also interesting about this is the people that live here. The people, getting to know the people. I mean, the people die of, of just horrific things like cuts um, that, that, that get infected. I mean, um, the pe childbirth. It's just, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's very, very uh, hard place. You know, to, you forge these relationships with these people. They become near and dear to you. And then you find out a year or two later that they, they died suddenly. Um, interesting enough, too, they don't eat the lemurs. Which is, which, is, which is very interesting in a place where most of the people there are a large percentage of the people are protein malnourished with all these lemurs around there and they don't eat them. What's sad is some people from other areas of Madagascar are moving in, they don't have that same taboo. Um, so those people actually will harvest the lemurs sometimes and eat them. Um, so a hard place for the lemurs to live, uh, of course a hard place for uh, the local people to live as well. So here we're just looking, these are all different groups. So we're sampling, uh, there's the orange group and the yellow group and the teal group and some of these groups we talked about before. Um, and here's what a normal year looks like. Um, you can see there's a lot of variability here, um, but we actually, we, we ran a bunch of, of modeling and we ran a bunch of statistics and found that you can, they cluster pretty well. And you can actually, for the most part, determine through things like discriminant function analysis when you're going to find a drought year versus when you're not. Um, and uh, here you've got the cyclone year, and the values look quite a bit different, you know, than they do these other years. Um, and again, these are all different groups, and there's different members or different numbers of animals um, for these uh, for these different groups. So green group. Um, you know, these, there's, a, there's a light purple group. We had quite a few of these different groups. And we were able to sample. This is, again, all comes from their tail hair. Um, so, you know, years and years of collecting these animals' tail hair. And again, accompanying with this, we have data on their tooth loss, which is also paints a pretty interesting picture. It, it was actually collected right after. So at the, we, we can't include all the data from there because of the way, getting to your, your point earlier of when the hair grows. Mm -hmm. So we can only collect, we, we, we got more hair samples, but we had to make sure that we were getting hair that was grown right previous. So the hair that we were analyzing is indicative of what they're doing during the cyclone. During the cyclone. Yeah, during the cyclone. So is that showing that they were eating more diverse resources? Yeah, they actually start spreading out. The groups start the, the spreading out and probably, whoops, eating different, completely different types of foods. Spreading out uh, well, they don't have that much room. They only have uh, this area here that these guys are living in um, is probably uh, maybe 20 hectares. Mm -hmm. They don't have much room at all. So what do, what do these guys do? Well, they spread out. On, on, on the landscape differently, but then they start using resources that they would maybe consume things like barks, uh, or start eating uh, foods that are high, you know, maybe leaves that are high in, um, high, well, I don't have a picture of this, but a lot of the, um, the leaves were blown off trees. Um, so they were eating like very, very small leaf buds. Um, they were eating uh, seeds that they, that, 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 that they probably don't process. The shifox can process these seeds pretty well. We don't have shifox data, but the ring-tailed lemurs, they don't. The ring-tailed lemurs snouts a little bit longer. The shifox pushed in so they can get better bite force down on that molar. So, yeah, it, it, and again, this is why it's very important to have feeding data to accompany this because you can see we're kind of taking stabs in the dark here. Um, but again, it does, it, it shows 
a pattern of them eating different diets. And most, in most cases, I mean, it's kind of hard to see in these, in these sort of figures, but they are uh, significantly different from one another. And so you've got these guys way up here. Again, thinking about this looks, this looks like the values of mouse lemurs in terms of nitrogen, yet these are ring-tailed lemurs. So they're eating, they're not going out eating a lot of insects. Other thing that they might be doing is they might now be really, really stressed in terms of water. When you sweat, you're gonna sweat out water, right? And you're, what, you, what, what you find, and when you urinate, what we generally do is we, we prefer to, to, to urinate out nitrogen 14. We keep nitrogen 15 in our system, and so we become elevated in nitrogen 15. And so people will say, well, what you're, what you're detecting here is a trophic change. Actually, what you might be, be detecting is dehydration. So that's why the isotope stuff, again, <laughs> Pair, bless your heart, pairing it with, with, with other types of, of data so that you can actually make sense out of this stuff. Okay, so this is kind of the same. These are just basically, this is all we're looking at here is carbon. Um, so here's, you know, black group, blue group. This is parcel one, or pink, pink number one, pink number two, orange group, teal group. And it's just, just to show you that there's variation. Um, and so here's the normal, there's the normal year. Not too, too much variation. I mean, there's a little bit of va variation in the orange group. I will say this, that outlier up there was a, a sick female. And this is a group where we had about 13 individuals. Some of these other groups here, we didn't have very many individuals. Here's, again, carbon. We're still looking at carbon here. Lots of variables here in the yellow group. Again, a story to tell about this. The yellow group crossed a river. Uh, the river flooded. And they got, they got harpooned or, or marooned on the other side. And um, talking about stress levels in these guys, when they got stuck on that other side, there were a bunch of domestic dogs. And those domestic dogs started picking them off. They left and went across that river with probably 20-odd animals. They came back with like 12. And cat, domestic cats were, were, were taking them off as well. So... Uh, they, these guys were forced to eat just basically off one type of shrub for about three or four months. So again, the, the understanding is a little bit about the observations and the stories to make sense out of the data. And then here's the cyclone. Again, this, the, the black group here, lots of variability. Um, seems like the groups, in, in, you know, in general, um, they, there's quite a bit of, of variation in their carbon. So they're eating, um, you know, from, from, from areas that uh, uh, maybe have been cut down uh, a little bit more. Uh, maybe some of them are sneaking, going deeper into the forest. Um, and then maybe they're incorporating things like cam plants. And then nitrogen, same sort of the story. This wasn't as significant. Um, again, you've got some variation in just a normal year. Um, the big ones are yellow group. Again, the same sort of story. They got marooned on the other side. Um, this is the pink group. I can't even recall much about that group. They were a small group, um, the black group. These outliers, again, in both cases, are uh, adult males that were in poor health, um, and then they're in the cyclone year. And the weird one here is green because the green group never really changed that much, but they did for some reason in the cyclone year. Yep. So why are you looking at these different types of isotopes? You've got nitrogen and carbon. And like, what, what, is, what is that getting at? Well, in terms of, I mean, in terms of the nitrogen, it's, it, you, you can start teasing out health variables, mm -hmm. um, or you can uh, j look at, you know, you could in, a, in other animals, you could look at things like insectivory, but the problem with this area is there's not too many insects. Mm -hmm. And then with the carbon, it's just where on that, where, you know, are they eating clam plants? Are they eating, if we just look at C3 plants, just those, those, um, those trees and shrubs, are they eating those in areas that are really, really forested, or are they eating them in those places that are anthropogenically disturbed? And that's what it is, some of the, this data suggests. So they're each getting a different line of evidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. So that, again, to, to, my, to my point I keep making, that's why this stuff is good as a supplement. Um, the strengths, of course, are like what we were talking about earlier is understanding cryptic behavior and understanding fossil behavior, area, you know, behavior of, of, of extinct animals.
So let's talk about extinct animals real quickly. So uh, here are, uh, many of you are very, very aware that we had these subfossil lemurs that were uh, found throughout uh, uh, Madagascar. In southwest Madagascar, uh, you had I think 17, 18 species of them. Um, and they, they had different locomotory patterns. They ate different types of foods. Um, and you can analyze, and this is what Brooke Crowley this is borrowing from her work, um, you can look at the isotopic values of their collagen. Um, and so you can get nitrogen and uh, carbon from the collagen. And so what we did is, and what we, she did is we, we and she compared uh, the values of living lemurs to that of subfossil lemurs. So when, what, what are the big differences between what subfossil lemurs are doing versus what these lemurs that are around today are? So the other thing you can do with, with isotopes is you can actually look at soil compositions, particularly soil carbonates, and you can see what types of plants were available in, these, in some of these ecologies. Has anybody ever heard of Artipithecus ramidus? Yeah, Artipithecus ramidus. Uh, so some people suggest that it was forest dwelling and some people suggest that it was savanna dwelling. And what these folks are fighting over oftentimes are the values of the soil carbonates. The soil carbonate values suggest that it was living in a savanna environment. Other people suggest that it was living in a forested environment. Probably it was living in a little bit of a mosaic more than anything. How long did the isotopes stay viable in the collagen mm -hmm. and fossils? Uh, until the collagen completely uh, is, 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 um, basically deteriorates. The problem with, with something like collagen, of course, is making sure that you're not looking at the isotope values of fungi, because mm -hmm. right, so fungus or other things can get in there and start, yeah, so you gotta make sure it's, it's clean. And they go through a series of, of, of washes, if you will, and then make sure that actually what you're sampling is collagen. And it, it looks really fluffy when it's all completely prepped. Yeah, look a little popcorny. Um, so they're obviously they're called subfossil lemurs, right? Because they're not completely fossil. And have you seen the the new videos of these folks that are scuba diving and they're looking at the lemur? Yeah, amazing. Yeah, just all those like intact bones, and maybe they could get DNA out of them. I don't know if they can or they can't. And they got DNA out of a three hundred thousand year old uh, um, Homo heidelbergensis, one of our ancestors that was roaming around Europe. Okay, so uh, stable isotope studies, again, one way to get um, very, very broad dietary data uh, uh, you, uh, of these extinct lemurs um, and compare those values uh, to, to, to living lemurs. Um, and one of the ideas that's been sort of preponderant among lemur lemurologists is that you had these large communities of, um, you, you had these large communities of um, subfossil lemurs um, the subfossil lemurs uh, die out either by hunting or by ha habitat, habitat change. And the small little lemurs that we find today move into those niches. They start going in and, and, and utilizing the niches that are now open uh, because these big large lemurs um, are now all extinct. And so, um, I'll get back to this in just a second, but uh, this is data from Brooke Crowley. Um, and so what she's found are these are your fossil, subfossil lemurs. Here's Hydropithecus, there's that grass-eating lemur out there, big, huge, large grass-eating lemur. And you've got this, these values here, and this is using Euclidean geometry, centroids, not using just um, standard deviations and means, what we've been kind of doing. Um, but here you got your living lemurs. Um, uh, or lemurs that have recent that that, that are, are still alive today, but are older, and you know, so you know greater or less than than uh, 900 years uh, before present. Um, and you find, you know, you can find a clear difference here. Not a clear difference. Some of these guys are inhabiting some of the same ecologies, but what they argued is when these guys go extinct that these lemurs here, if these models that we had proposed before, that the, 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 the little lemurs that we find today, these ecologies are now open, why aren't they moving right up into here? And they're not doing that. They're staying here. They're, what, and what, the, what, what, what these folks suggested is that they're going through what they call an ecological retreat, that they're starting to use different ecosystems all the way. Um, and so instead of moving into these new 
uh, isotope spaces, they're staying in a different isotope space altogether. Yep. Mm -hmm. do you, so that's a good question and you don't have fossilized remains but you have some of these that are uh, greater or lesser than about 900 years old mm -hmm. and what is also interesting is I mentioned before that um, the local people don't don't uh, eat these lemurs or hurt these lemurs but you can go to some of these cave sites um, uh, of, 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 and, and you can find um, lemur le lemur catabones that actually have cut marks on them which suggests they don't do anything to the lemurs, but their ancestors did. Their ancestors may have ate them. Um, and again, so, so here is, this is a very interesting lemur. This is the grass-eating lemur. And if you look at its teeth, its teeth look, that does not look like a primate tooth at all. That looks like a cow or a horse's tooth. Has anybody ever rubbed their hand over a cow or horse tooth? They're very, very rough because this is enamel and this is dentine. And when you rub your finger across it, it grinds. It's very, very sharp. And that's because these animals are eating a lot of grays or brows and they grind it down. They, when you, you know, obviously, when you take something big and you make it smaller, you increase its surface area and it's easier to digest. And we find that this grass eating tooth is actually, we find that in the isotope signal as well. So these guys, unfortunately, have all gone extinct but we do have um, their bones and we do have the isotope values of them. Um, again, this is where she did this work here. Um, there's basal mafale, so it's in this spiny thicket region. Um, and here is, you had, you know, thousands of, of large lemurs that have now gone extinct. And these are some of these fossil sites, um, um, subfossil lemur sites where they actually collected um, some of these bones and, and analyze them for carbon values. Uh, the same slide, this is just my work on it, and it, it, if you do it a little differently, if you don't use um, sort of this Euclidean uh, geometry, if you just look at standard deviations um, and means, there's the, the, the Beza guys, and they're the subfossil lemurs. So they are appearing, they are using different little ISO spaces or little niches. And there's that oddball there. Now, one of the things that, again, talking about ring-tailed lemurs that uh, are, you know, they were you know, they're supposed to move into these new uh, ecologies when those large lemurs uh, go extinct. Um, one of the things that's interesting about ring-tailed lemurs is they started using gallery forests. And so, so places like Barente or Beza Mafali Special Reserve, these are southwestern, southern sites, and people traditionally have studied lemurs there, and they started developing all these models of, of how these lemurs live and the foods that they eat. Well, it might be that those are lemurs that have actually started utilizing new ecosystems, and you can tell that from their teeth. Ring-tailed lemur teeth uh, have really, really thin enamel, and this is a keely fruit or a tamarind fruit, and when you eat it, there's these fibers, and these fibers rip apart their teeth. So, after, after, shortly after these animals can reach adulthood, they wear out their teeth, mm -hmm. and when you start wearing out your teeth, you can start, you know, you can't process food. So this might be one of the reasons why some of these individuals started consuming feces, those really, really old animals. So we find those high nitrogen levels and we, with animals that we think are consuming a little bit more feces, but also, again, wearing down your teeth, maybe you're starting to break down your own tissues. This also could be indicative of those high nitrogen values. And then there's that tooth comb, right? Here's that beautiful tooth comb, six tooth tooth comb on that lemur, and now it's broken off. Uh, the interstitial spaces here are a little wider. Now these animals are um, not, at, they're not as effective at, at, at removing ectoparasites off one another. Again, I studied parasites and when I look at their feces, we'd find ectoparasites that are actually removed when these animals um, started, uh, would groom one another. So, um, you know, uh, 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 the, 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 these, so it appears just looking at the teeth that they're occupying new spaces. And that's it. Um, I have some other stuff uh, so with um, with um, vervet monkeys and, and and chimps and stuff, but I'll I can leave unless people want to really see that stuff. We can talk about that, but um, that that's it in terms of just the lemurs.
Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to. So if the Shafak are cam feeders, mm -hmm. should we be feeding them more succulents? Well, they, so they eat more cam, but they, you know, where I was working with them in, uh, in that protected parcel, they didn't eat as much cam uh, because it just wasn't available. So they all, I think that they're a little more, so they eat a, a, a in, in, in where we were, there's a, there's a thing called a fomata, it's a euphorb, mm -hmm. and um, they can, and apparently it's a carcinogen, it's a naturally occurring carcinogen, and they would just eat it and eat it and eat it. Um, and it, it, it produced like a sort of milk on it. Um, and what's really weird is the local people would actually put it on themselves because um, it, it would pull the skin together. I think they'd actually use it as kind of to hide wrinkles and stuff. Um, but, um, you know, I, I think that you probably, I mean, the, the diets that you're giving them are probably far more dialed in. I wouldn't trust an isotopic ecologist, let's put it that way. Um, they can, um, they can, uh, they, they, they have a lot of, um, um, in terms of filivery, in terms of eating leaves, I think they have a lot more laterality than something like a ring-tailed lemur, so they can. And again, eating those, um, those succulents in that area makes sense because there's high water content in them. Yeah, so you can get all the water. You know, these guys don't drink water. The ring-tailed lemurs would drink water. They put their hands in these arboreal cisterns and drink water. I never saw the Shifox drink water once. So, yeah. What did the Shifox here eat? You just, just, just browse that you give them? Um, they get veggies. Okay. Chow and fresh browse. Okay, yeah. But you see, we have them uh, living out in the natural forest. Sure. In the summer. Sure. You see them eating, you know, leaves and trees. You see them eating fruits if there's any fruits to go. But also okay. they'll be out. They eat the grass too, right? Yeah, birds. Yeah. Sure. He, these Shifox would come to the ground a lot to eat the herbs. They would come down and, um, and um, you know, they say Shifox never, they, that was what I was always told, Shifox never come to the ground. And they, yeah, the ones at Basil would come to the ground all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, yeah, they told me you'd rare. And of course, the people that would tell me that were people who never spent time walking. So the other thing that they would do that was really interesting is the shafox on really, really hot days would come to the ground and hold tree trunks. Yeah. Yeah. I could, I'd be up there looking all over all day trying to find them, and they're on the ground the whole time. Yeah, yeah exactly. So you get cooler. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. yeah. I, I am. So I, it was funny because the ring-tailed lemurs would eat, like I said, they'd eat feces and they'd eat trash from the camps and stuff. And I always just thought that the Shifox just looked at him like, you medical waste eaters, and just <laughs> sort of bounce, you know, and hear the ring-tailed lemurs like, you know, they're eating anything they could get their hands on. Um, and there was, we, we, did, we did medical stuff, and sometimes, the, you know, we'd find the, the lemurs just into everything. You know, scent marking plates and stuff that you're gonna be eating off, you know, and yeah, and then you had these, these just, you know, sort of elegant Shifox just jumping through the forest. So yeah, different, completely different habitat or uh, um, um, substrate use and different diets, and you, know, you can when you run the stats on it, you find a clear differences. It's reflected in their isotope values. Yeah, yeah. but again, this is it, I, I love doing this type of work, but it is it's very broad. You can only speak broadly to what you're finding. Nothing is a substitute for going out with a pen and paper and writing down their behavior. And I, I will be, I will admit, I, people get, they just fall in love with new techniques and so isotopes are kind of cool right now and so, it, you know, you can, you can publish this stuff and I think after a while people are like, well wait a minute, you're telling me Jeff Fox eat more cam than ring-tailed lemurs? Couldn't I have figured that out just, you know, going out and watching them right. a little bit? Right, especially the fossilized. Yeah, I mean, exactly. You can compare the fossilized to the modern. I mean, it yeah. allows us to Broaden that temporal aspect of it. Yeah. In case you didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You're yeah. welcome. Yeah. No, it's true. Huh. So. Any other well, thank you so much for, for coming. I appreciate it. Yeah. Try to not get too deep into the chemistry stuff over <laughs> yeah. there, you know. Oh yeah, and thank you for coming on such a rainy day.
Yeah, talking about cyclones, right? And like yeah. we're in the middle of. What is the difference between a cyclone and a hurricane? I have no idea. Aren't so hurricanes? Like, cyclones were supposed to be quite urban. Is it because I don't think there's one other than that? So that's it? I think that's all it is. Oh, yeah. yeah. I think they're the same one, too. What is it? Yeah, typhoons or two? Yeah. Another typhoons or another one? Typhoons or cyclones or hurricanes? I don't know how to.